I'm a psychologist. Uh, I've been working in the field of diabetes for a very long time, um, 30, oh my, 37 years now. And um, my interest is, is really in improving the quality of life of individuals living with diabetes. And I'm particularly interested in offering this session to you today because we're actually living through a fairly difficult time from a psychological perspective. And so my goal is to be supportive of how we're navigating this. And so this is a journey, and I'd like to hopefully help you on this path that you're on. These are my disclosures, and it's, con it's um, uh, con current practice for professionals to declare any relationships that they have um, with private trees. And so, as you probably are aware, this session is sponsored by LifeScan, and I also have a number of relationships with industries where I offer uh, consultation or speaking fees. So let's begin by understanding the emotional impact of COVID and how that can interfere and what we can do to promote good diabetes care during this time. As a psychologist, I'd like to emphasize the point that if you can understand what you're experiencing, you can work with it. And my job really is to help people with that understanding. So what do we know about what we're all experiencing at this time? And we know that there is um, impact uh, on our mental health following any kind of a, of a disaster, any kind of a, of a traumatic type of experience. And, and it, it's fair to describe COVID as having a world impact on everybody. And you can see from this slide that there are actually phases to how people are impacted by something like, like this. And you see the, the pre-disaster phase. And maybe you can remember in January and February when we were hearing, okay, what was happening? What's coming? It, it's, it was from China. Okay, now it's in Europe. Okay, now it's hitting North America. You have the impact stage. And, and then we, we kind of got down to work and we went through this, what we call heroic stage. And you, you heard a lot of, of, of what we did during that time. And, and, you know, Canada was kind of known for, for capturing the phrase caremongering um, because it was in the context of scaremongering that was happening. Um, and so we sort of showed ourselves well. But then you kind of end this, you kind of go through this coasting time we call it the honeymoon stage and then disillusionment. And do you remember all the protests that started happening in the United States? Well, that was the disillusionment phase happening and then reconstruction. And so this is the natural pathway. The challenge that we face is, are we done? And so, you know, we all are in some phase of reopening. And now the next question is really, what is next? Um, we talk about the new normal, but let's be honest, a new normal is, is actually not normal. It wasn't the way it was before. It's some kind of new. And so that's challenging for us all. What if there is a second wave? What, what happens if we end up having to, to kind of go back inside just as we're beginning to go outside? A lot of uncertainty. And we'll see in this slide, I've kind of indicate three really psychological experiences. And these are, are actually normal psychological experiences that match the situation. What happens to people when they feel threat? What happens to people when they experience losses? What happens to people when they experience injustice? And we know what's happening right now in the United States regarding race, this injustice that's being identified and the reaction that everybody is having to that. And so when I show you this slide, I'd like you to, to take away that these experiences uh, our normal experiences to what's actually happening in life. And so now the question becomes, what can we do about those? What we can know about COVID is that it's a stress. Um, humans like routine. We get into habits, we get into patterns. This is how we live our lives. Um, it just becomes easier if we do things that are on kind of automatic pilot. But we don't do them just automatically. We also grow to become comfortable in them. So we have our favorite route to drive to work. We stop at our favorite coffee shop, order a coffee in the way that we like it. And this makes our lives comfortable and, and it really makes our lives actually functional. But guess what? 
we're not driving to work anymore. We're actually not going into coffee shops. Um, and so all of a sudden, nothing is normal. And that is stressful because we don't know what to do. And so you can see on this slide that there's kind of this, this uh, curve. You can see that red line. It's the inverted U. And this is a very classic um, understanding of the relationship between stress and function. And so COVID is a big stress that everybody is affecting, being affected by rather. And then as stress goes up, function actually goes up. You, you kind of get to work, you get to action. But if it gets too high, then it becomes negative and it starts to interfere with function. So this is an uh, important point for us all to reflect on as we navigate through this pandemic, as you live with diabetes through this pandemic, how are you on this stress curve? And for, again, remember, if you can describe what's happening, then you can do something about it. So it's not good or bad if you're feeling stressed. It, it's, it is. It's what's actually experienced. And we have reasons to be stressed. I mean, we, we, we all got bubbled up, you know, 10, 11 weeks ago. And that kind of changed things quite a bit because for many of us, this meant we were kind of inside when we had lived our world on the outside. And when we did go outside, all of a sudden, it's not very normal. Canadians are friendly and helpful. Uh, you're in the grocery store and somebody drops something on the, uh, on the floor. You reach down to pick it up for them. Well, no, now you don't. Now you look at people and it's like, get away from me. And so we can see that it's actually really, really challenging for us all. And there are predictable impacts of these kind of stresses. And what are those predictable impacts? Well, our world is different. Our work lives are different. Our leisure lives are different. Parenting is different. Relationships are different. Boy, oh boy, that's a lot of aspects of your life that are affected. And the psychological impact of that is that this can affect your mood. It's important for us to look at the substance use issues because many people are turning to substances as, way of, as ways of coping. Um, potential for relationship conflict, and also potential for violence. And so these are issues that are kind of hanging around when we examine how people are managing. And so the point number one is COVID is stressful. And why is that important? That's an important point because we know that, that life is a balance between the things that happen in our life that are stressful, that kind of interfere with our day, that kind of make us hard, the problems that we might experience on a daily basis. But then we have our plans. So if you can see this depicted in this slide, this kind of balance between, you know, on the right, your plan of the day, you're gonna take care of business, you've got things in hand, and then there are the stresses that happen. But what happens in our lives when stress goes up? Well, guess what? When stress goes up, self-care, goes down. And this is particularly important if you're living with diabetes, because diabetes, we know, requires a fair amount of self-management. And so self-care becomes critically important. And so I'm very interested in the psychological impact of COVID on individuals living with diabetes, because we have to balance this so that the self-care can become managed during the stress. And that's really what today's session is about. Stress is unavoidable, and we know a lot about how people respond to stress. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that, and then I want to talk about some coping strategies, both coping strategies in general, but also coping strategies specifically for managing diabetes. Now, here you see the typical stress response. So on the left is just an indication that when a human is stressed, it has a strong, strong impact on their body functions. It pretty much affects most aspects of your body. But it also calls for action. People respond. And we categorize the um, response to stress into four categories. There's the fight response. There's the flight response. There's the tend response. And the befriend response. And these are different strategies for when people are stressed. And you may know people who... Um, when they get stressed, they kind of go on, almost they go on the attack. They, they get kind of aggressive. They, they want to get in there and they want to 
change. Other people, they just want to get out of there. And, and, and others that just kind of take a deep breath and take care of themselves. And then others who reach out to others. And we've seen that through um, this uh, 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 a pandemic, uh, lots of examples of, of this. And again, I'm not trying to suggest that one is good and the other is not good. I want to suggest that these all have different functions and people have different personal styles. And what we do as psychologists is try to help people, first of all, find out what is your plan A? What is your automatic response? So if you're the flight type of person, um, then what is it that, that, that ma what situations match that response? And then if it's not working, can you consider other responses? And so we know that, how do we know that the stress is impacting us? There's a number of surveys that have come out. And this is a survey from the United States that's basically just asking the question, how have uh, how has the uh, life in quarantine affected our behaviors? And you can see from the slide that 40% uh, of people say they're eating more snack foods, uh, screen time has gone up by uh, 50%. And so, you know, there's some negatives and also some positives, right? That uh, two thirds of people say they're making home cooked meals and that they're eating more fresh food. So. Um, new opportunities and risks. And that's something that we need to, to be mindful of. We also have um, some data from Canada on how the pandemic has affected the general population. And let me just show you that. So this data are from Canada, and you can see that there's a very, very powerful impact on how we're functioning. If you look at the slide, the slide on the on the left, you'll see 84% of the people that are surveyed from uh, Statistics Canada are, are are worried about overloading the healthcare system. 54% are worried about the mem members of their household, um, and so again, we see that as a fairly broad impact that it's having. Um, last uh, just a week or so ago, the Mental Health Index, which was looking at generally how are people managing, and you can see that in the current month of April, it was sort of down by 12 points. So, so the negative impact on mental health in general has really been seen. Um, and that's also shown by another survey that um, I'll show you now. So this survey um, was done in Canada and um, it was done at the end of April. And it really kind of took a look at how we're doing from a mental health point of view. And, and again, good news, bad news situation, but certainly telling us that things have had a big impact. And so if you look at the top left, 44% of the people are saying they're worried. 41% are saying they're anxious. Um, now, interestingly, 34% are reporting feeling grateful. And so this mix of feelings, if you look at the top right, um, the, your mental health and your physical well-being, you can see that on those red bars indicate that 50% of the population here are saying that their mental health is worse, 42% saying their physical health is worse. And on the bottom, it talks about relationships. And this is a good news, bad news situation. On the, on the bottom right side, you see 32% of people are saying that their relationships with people outside of their household, outside of that bubble, are actually worse. But interestingly, inside the bubble on the left, 24% of the people say their relationships have actually improved with people inside their household, and only 14% are saying that it's worse. So that's kind of a, a bit of a reassurance. But from our perspective, the stress is there. And why is that important? And um, I'd like to describe to you why it's important for us to really track stress. And this is really a, a, a way of understanding our experience. And so this is, is normal psychology. So the perception of threat leads to the feeling of anxiety. The perception of loss leads to the feeling of sadness. And the perception of injustice or intrusion leads to the feeling of anger. So if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling angry, that actually isn't abnormal. The question then is, are you feeling threatened? And if you are, what is the threat and what can you do about it? Are you feeling, experiencing a loss? And if you are, what is that loss and what can you do about it? If you're experiencing injustice, what is that injustice and, and what can you do about it? And notice that what I've done here is I've shifted the conversation from, oh, you're feeling something and that's bad, 
to, oh, well, what is driving? What's underlying that feeling? And then what can you do about it? And so this is important because this helps us to understand how do we manage stress so that it can um, allow us to get back to, let's say, diabetes care, as well as get back to what will be this quote-unquote new normal because we have the opportunity to build new habits as we sort of re-emerge from our bubbles into our worlds. So now let's look at how we can manage stress. And if you would agree with me that as stress goes up, self-care goes down, then reducing stress will actually allow you to get back to the work that you would like to do. And so this is one of the really important aspects of functioning. And again, I'm presenting this in the context of, of normal psychology, not abnormal psychology. And um, what do we know about the impact of stress and coping? And we actually know some things that can be helpful. But, right, you can't focus on your diabetes if your stress is too high. It's kind of like painting the kitchen when the house is on fire. You can't focus, you can't concentrate. This is what we know about stress. So this tells us really that stress management is really important for good diabetes care. Stress management, though, requires us to understand what are an individual's typical responses and how do you actually go and manage stress from that perspective. And psychologists like to understand behavior. And so you can see this picture of a radio and just imagine there's a radio signal. And, and what people do with that, if that radio signal is, 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 and the strength of that signal represents the stress, it's interesting to note that there are two kinds of people in the world. Some people, when they get stressed, they turn the volume down. They try to minimize the stress. They try to push it down. And that's a way of coping. And it's not good or bad. It just is. So that works really well if you're a firefighter, if you're a police officer, if you're a nurse. Um, you know, you've got to deal with a crisis situation. So the best way to deal with it, if you feel stress, personal stress, is to push that down so you can get into action. Um, but then if you push it down and get into action, what happens to those feelings? Um, and so the other way that people can cope is, is some people will turn the volume up. And those people focus in on their feelings. And that can really help you manage your emotions, but it could distract you from the tasks. And so, again, this helps us to kind of frame up how, what is your response and what can you do about it? So I would just ask you as you're listening to this, which of these two patterns is more consistent with your style? And, and again, it's not a judgmental statement. It's a descriptive statement because then that can help us frame up where you go with coping. What we know about coping is that there are two general styles of coping, what we call problem solving or action focused coping, and then emotion focused coping. And this naturally leads to the fact that those people that tend to push the volume of stress down get into action. So they're the problem solving and the ones that allow the stress to kind of become their focus, become emotion focused. And it's important because if the situation doesn't match the options, then what are the disadvantages? So if you're a problem-focused coper, great. You're probably really good at actions. But what about your feelings? And this is where anger and substance abuse comes in. A lot of people who tend to, you know, be action-focused and don't like to focus on their feelings try to end up kind of moderating their feelings with um, alcohol or substances. Um, and so, you know, that's where a little bit of emotion-focused coping could help somebody like that. Now, the emotion-focused person is really good at, at focusing on their feelings, but sometimes those feelings can get overwhelming, and that can start to interfere. And so those people, maybe they would benefit from a little bit more of action-focused coping. And so it, you can see what I'm saying here is that really trying to find out where are you, what is your starting point, what I like to call your plan A, and then just ask you if it's working great, if it's not, what's your plan B? And this is where alternative coping strategies can become really, really helpful. Um, I'd also like to make a comment about, um, about emotions and, um, and how we actually would approach our emotional experiences. 
You can see on this slide, I, I've actually d differentiated or separated pro what I call primary emotions and secondary emotions. And what's important about this is that primary emotions tend to be actually normal. If you're feeling threatened, you'll be angry. If you're feeling a loss, you'll be sad. If you're feeling an injustice, you'll be angry. And those feelings fit the situation. And so the way in, in, that you can manage that is really by acknowledging those feelings and sort of making them real. And the example I would give you that we would all understand would be grief. Everybody knows that, the, that, that when somebody is grieving a loved one's boss, that you let them feel it. You don't, you don't get them to push their emotions away because you, you understand that feeling sad is actually the appropriate way to, to handle that situation. And then secondary emotions tend to be when you get a bit out of proportion, you kind of overdo it. And if you've ever woken up in the middle of the night and have kind of ruminative thoughts that make you anxious and you're worried, you'll sort of realize that, you know what, it's kind of out of proportion because a lot of times when you wake up the next morning, you kind of think, well, it wasn't actually that bad. So that would be an example of a secondary emotion. And it's really useful because then this helps us when it comes to coping. And so I'd like to really turn to this because um, we actually have um, uh, a set of strategies that have been proven to be really helpful to people. And I'd like to talk to you about those for a sec. So this is something that psychologists actually know quite a bit about. We've, we've spent a lot of time as sort of a behavioral scientist trying to understand and support people and how they might cope with stress. And so I can summarize that for you with this slide. And, and the best way to understand it is if you look at that little balloon on the bottom right, this poor little guy is trying to, okay, now how's he gonna move and get away from here when he's sitting on a bed of needles? Um, and so stress management becomes really, really important. But I'd like you to understand that it's really matching the coping strategy to the person. So when, when, when we ask the question, what are the coping strategies that actually help people? And the answer is the coping strategies that help people are the ones that make sense to you, the ones that when you do, you feel better, and when you do, you want to do it again. It's not, there's no magic in the coping strategy. The magic is in the matching of the coping strategy to the individual. We also know that coping skills are additive. If you do one, that's good. If you do two, that's better. If you do three and four and five, that's even better. The more you do it, the better it is. So those, it's important. So I offer sort of this, um, this kind of guide, not as a way of you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, but as a way of suggesting if you're feeling stressed, if that stress is interfering with your diabetes and you kind of buy the idea that lowering the diabetes, this, I'm sorry, lowering the stress will kind of give you more energy to focus on the diabetes. These are ways that you could lower the stress. And the first coping strategy we call physical calming. Any sort of activity that you do that allows you to kind of calm, to relax, deep breathing, muscle relaxation, yoga, tai chi, prayer, um, having, if, if you like reading a book with a cup of tea, you know, tending some plants, whatever you would do in a day that would give you this sense of calm is very, very important for managing stress. Equally important, is physical discharge. Your body reacts to stress by revving up, getting ready for action, and, and engaging in action can be really, really helpful. And so physical exercise, dancing, any kind of movement that kind of burns off, that stress has been shown to be really helpful. Social connection. It's really important in stress to, see, to be connected. And imagine going through COVID before cell phones, we would be so much more isolated. The, the cell phone and the internet and Zoom and all of these platforms have really allowed us to maintain the social connection, which is actually really, really good. Emotional expression. We know that if you bottle in and you suppress your emotions, that that's not actually unhealthy. And so finding ways of, 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 um, of expressing your emotions, and it doesn't have to be talking. A lot of art, a lot of music is really about emotional expression. And then finally, what we call mindfulness or acceptance, which is really that, that you know, you've all heard that phrase, right? Sort of, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, control what you can and accept what you can't and try to have the wisdom to know the difference. And so when you look at this slide, I'd like you to think about what do you do from each of those categories? Do you have strategies? And if you could think about what you might do, 
there's a tremendous amount of, um, of, of benefit that we all can, can take by engaging in these kinds of strategies. And sometimes you can do this for 30 seconds, for a minute, and, and it can be really helpful. Just before I talk about how we get the diabetes back on the agenda and how we might actually be able to improve diabetes management in the context of what we're experiencing now, I just want to make one final comment about sort of managing the stresses associated with COVID. We're very familiar with hand hygiene and its importance in COVID, but I'd also like to import and stress to you the importance of lifestyle hygiene. And the three things to just be mindful of here is we know that humans do like routines, so try to find a new routine. Structure your day. If it's important for you, 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 you had a, uh, a Monday to Friday work day and a, work, a weekend, and now you aren't working because your job is not doesn't exist right now. Um, so maybe you could still have a Monday to Friday and then a weekend's off. Be, be very mindful of sleep pattern. You may not have the same sort of uh, activities that are necessary during the day, but we know that sleep is really important for um, stress and for diabetes. And then just the idea that exercise can actually boost your mood and also is also helpful for your immune system. So now let me shift gears, if I may, and really talk a bit about diabetes specifically. So the question then really is, how do I manage diabetes? When maybe the routine that you had that was working isn't there, perhaps you're experiencing changes in your eating because food is so accessible and maybe um, you know, is, is pleasurable or provides stress management. And maybe you feel a little bit disconnected from your healthcare provider. And so there are some challenges here and I'd like to kind of walk us through this a little bit. So what is the role of your provider? And you know, we know that, that the way we really try to promote diabetes care is that the provider's there to understand you and to provide you a, really a safe place to kind of adjust to your diabetes, to, to really adapt to the tasks of self-management. We see this, we call it a change-based relationship where the provider's there to support you. Um, and then to manage the specific aspects of diabetes, you know, blood glucose is, is of course the central aspect of diabetes management, and then the medication dose uh, escalation. And so, um, you know, this is good news, isn't it? Um, but really, when you think about it, have you ever felt that what the clinician says is more important than what you think? Have you ever felt that your clinician is judging you? Have you ever felt like going into the diabetes clinic or seeing your physician? It's like a, being a kid being called into the principal's office. But we know that, in fact, this is a very common experience that people have. People very commonly tell us this. And so it is great. I'm not criticizing the diabetes care provider. I work inside the diabetes care world, and I understand the value of that. But I'd like to suggest that maybe we've got an opportunity. And let me elaborate on that. So my question for you is, is COVID an opportunity um, for you to play a, a bit more of a role? And so here you see this kind of relationship. Who's the most important person in the room? Are you? Or where the clinician is kind of there to meet your needs? Or do you sometimes feel that, you know, you're kind of the letter lesser importance? And what's really interesting about diabetes now is that the telehealth is bringing the doctor into your into your home. It's bringing the clinician into your home. So rather than you going out to the doctor and the diabetes management sort of existing outside of your home, there's a really interesting opportunity here where that diabetes kind of exists not inside your home. And I think that has some potential. So what is it that you could do in that context? Now that we're really taking advantage of what we call telemedicine and everything tells us that people will continue to access telemedicine after COVID. If you have to drive 90 minutes to get to an appointment, maybe you don't want all of your appointments to be in person. Maybe you're gonna to prefer to have a telehealth session so that you don't have to do that driving. And, then, and that gives you the opportunity really to kind of become, in a way, the leader of the team. And so as the leader of the team, what is it that you need to do? And I'm a, 
I'm a diabetes psychologist, I guess. And so I can tell you that really as a, as a, a person living with diabetes, the tasks are really somehow coming to terms with your, your disease so that it's okay to have it, okay enough that you don't ignore it. So we call that disease acceptance. That you're okay with the treatments that you're on, the medications, the insulins, and that you're actually prepared to do what you need to do to control your glucose levels. And so disease acceptance, treatment acceptance, and adherence, those are really the, the, the work of diabetes management. And I think we have some interesting opportunities now. And so I'd like to talk about each of these quickly and show you a way that you can sort of understand where you are now, and that will help you to figure out where to go next. So let's talk about disease acceptance. What does that actually mean? Well, these two questions can be really helpful. How serious do you, you view diabetes to be in your life? And it has to be kind of serious enough that you, need, you will want to take care of it. Your motivation is based on the extent that there's a problem. If you're if your house doesn't need a new roof, you're not motivated to put a new roof on your house. But if you're, you realize that the roof is leaking and it's gonna damage the walls and this is a problem, this is serious, you, then you're gonna have the motivation to do something about it. And how much personal responsibility do you have for managing diabetes? And if we ask these questions, not from a critical way, but from a non-judgmental way, then you can see what that does, is that you can see high and low seriousness, high and low personal responsibility. And the person who says, this is an important problem that I need to do something about, we call those people accepting. But maybe you think it's serious, but I don't have any role in it. So I just have to wait for my doctor. You're, you're kind of passive. If it's low seriousness, but high responsibility, then you're kind of uncertain. I know I have something to do, but I'm not quite sure is, you know, you know what's wrong with my sugars being above level X? I'm not quite so sure if that's a big, big deal. I know my doctor said something about it, but I'm not really clear on it. So we call that un uncertain or low and low is indifferent. And this is not judgmental language. This is descriptive language. And what's I, what I really like about and what I actually do in my clinical practice most of the time is I work with the uncertain, indifferent and passive people and helping them to figure out, okay, how do we increase the seriousness? How do we increase the sense of personal responsibility? It's a very useful way of understanding your behavior, and then that helps you with your needs. So if you're in the uncertain condition, you might say, okay, can you guys tell me what's the big deal here? Why is this so serious? Because I know you say I should do it, but I am not quite so convinced. Tell me. And so it becomes really a way that you can direct your care. Now let's talk about Treatment acceptance. Wow, doesn't this look similar? And in treatment acceptance is based on, again, you can see this with two questions. And those questions are perceived need and perceived concern. To what extent do you need to do X? Do you need to take insulin? Do you need to take injectable? Do you need to take more medication to control your blood sugars? And you, your judgment on that is important. To what extent do you have concerns about achieving this control? What are your concerns about uh, medications? What are your concerns about self-testing? And those again are high and low. And then you can categorize the person who has high perceived need and low concern is accepting. The person with high need and high concern is ambivalent. The person with low perceived need and low concern, I don't have any problem with it, but I'm don't see the need for it, is indifferent. And the person with high concerns and low needs is a skeptical person. And that's important to understand. So again, this becomes a starting point. And so if you reflect on your own behavior, then that will help you to figure out where you are. And wherever you are is perfectly acceptable. And diabetes management, when you think about it from incorporating the psychological aspects of diabetes, is really very much about this. Okay, now let's talk about really the adherence piece. And so this is really about readiness to do the work. And um, this is really where blood glucose is so important because we know diabetes is really a, a glucose regulatory problem. And so glucose is really the important aspect of it. And the assumption that we make, and it's actually generally too true, is that you can't control what you can't measure. And let me just illustrate that to you. 
You're on the highway, you're driving at 120 kilometers an hour, and you've been on the highway for an hour and a half. You now exit the highway, and you're going to go to a school zone where the speed limit is 40 kilometers. Now, imagine getting from 120 kilometers where you've been for two hours, so you're kind of pretty comfortable at that, time, at that speed, down to 40 without a speedometer. By the time you get to 90, you're thinking that, hang on, I kind of feel like a turtle here. By the time you get to 70, you're worried that this guy's going to pass you. But you're still 30 kilometers above the speed limit, but you feel like you're crawling because it's all relative to where you were. How do you know it's 40? You have to have the meter. Well, I'd like to suggest to you that blood glucose monitoring should be exactly the same thing as speed monitoring in a car. It's just giving us a measure. And so this is potentially important, and let me explain why. The reason it's important is because you don't judge the speedometer. If you look down and you say, oh, I'm supposed to be driving 50, I'm driving 90, there's a cop car ahead of me, I think I'm going to slow down because I'm too fast. What happened in diabetes for some unfortunate reason is that we, we brought in the judgment. And so, you know, why did we ever decide to call it testing? Because um, what happens when you take a test? Well, we all know what happens when you take a test. You either pass or you fail. So all of a sudden, this judgmental language gets introduced into diabetes. And when it happens, because nobody can be in control of their sugars all of the time, there's so many factors that influence uh, any particular reading of blood glucose that it's, it's not directly under your behavior. There's lots of things that you can do to have a positive effect on your behavior, but the moment-to-moment -moment change is something that, that you know, is, is not always under your control. And what happens with this pass-fail, of course, is that Diabetes kind of feels like this. And if you've ever had this experience, this is not a good way to really manage. So we have an opportunity, and I'd like to elaborate a bit on that. The opportunity is really to look at our glucose levels at any given time as simply feedback. And this is actually really important, and it's important for a very num lot of reasons. And I think one, uh, I'll just show you a couple of the reasons why. One is, is the following. As we're going forward in diabetes management, we're starting to understand that blood sugars vary over the day. And good blood sugar control is really about kind of overall control. And so what are you before a meal? What are you two hours after a meal? What happens during the day? And the, the science on, on managing diabetes glucose levels is really helping us with this concept of time and range. So this is something that if you're not familiar with now, over the next few years, you will become quite familiar with this term. It's something that the clinicians are really finding that's actually really, really important. And so this really re would require a lot of readings, right? So, um, you know, you'd kind of have to be a little bit of like a detective, right? So when are your sugars at, at their highest and, and how high are they? And, and when are your sugars at the lowest and, and how low are they? And, 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 okay, so maybe we could have a look at when you go really high and see what we can do. Um, but this requires us to let go of the judgment. And if we do that and just look at blood glucose results as just feedback, then this offers a huge potential that I'd like to show you. Psychologists are familiar with something called biofeedback. Biofeedback is when you are able to track what's happening and that allows you to do something about it. So you can see in this picture here, this is, is, is biofeedback. And so this is the person that's looking at how much tension is in their forehead and um, how much uh, blood flow is going through their fingers. And they're actually able to control those by using biofeedback. So feeding back your biology and allows you to make changes. And the speedometer example fits perfectly to that. The second advantage that we have is technology. Um, and so let me show you what I mean by that. I, I don't want to make this sort of a boring data presentation, but I just want to make the point that using apps, using technology in diabetes has been shown to be helpful. And so this is just a, a series of research studies that kind of bring all the results together. 
And what you see there is that this, in multiple studies, using these apps has been shown to be helpful and improve diabetes control. So again, here is a, another um, indication that mobile health health apps have been actually really useful. This is looking at um, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, physical activity, weight outcomes, showing that apps are helpful. So I'm just trying to show you that the technology is sort of sitting there. And if we combine it with this idea of self-management, adherence, and taking control of our blood glucose as if it was just neutral feedback, we can really benefit from this. As well, when we look at our logbooks, they're kind of messy. They're kind of challenging. And if you've ever been, you know, in a situation where you're trying to make sense of what's gone on in the last number of months and, and weeks, it, it can actually be a real challenging activity for us to do. Um, and uh, and so much so that we've actually seen that that there can be some problems with the, the current way that we've been tracking our glucose levels. And what we hear from clinicians is that it's not easy to manage all of the data coming in. It's time consuming. What happens if you forget your logbook? Um, confidence in, in, in the sort of reporting can be sort of challenging. So currently, this isn't a really, um, people aren't highly satisfied, neither, neither the individuals or the clinicians. And research actually confirms this, where we're seeing some um, papers saying that sometimes the, um, the the record book isn't as accurate, and it becomes actually challenging and problematic um, to work with. And so, what are we going to do about this? Uh, and we have a really, really um, um, great opportunity to capitalize on what technology has already been developed. And I'd like to, to, to sort of finish this presentation off and then take some questions by really illustrating how we can go forward with this. So here's an example of how you use technology. This is a, 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 a the one touch reveal system that would actually take those records. So think about that, that record book, which you had seen. And, and what, how do you make sense of that? And then look at this. I mean, this is a way of presenting it back to you where um, the reds are high, the greens are in range, the blues are low. So all of a sudden you can see very, very quickly what's happening. And this is, is work that's done by the, by the technology in the background. And, you know, this can be really, really useful because it does a lot of that pattern recognition. It can also be there to kind of help give you immediate feedback. So, right, red is you're driving too fast. So hey, maybe you. What do you What do you need to do to take the foot off the gas? Blue is you're you're driving too slow. Hey, what do you do to 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 push the gas down? And if we use that same metaphor, um, whereas now, how do we make sense out of this? How do you say okay, well you've been actually high X percent of the time and low. It would take us you know 35 minutes somehow doing some kind of complicated math to be able to figure that out. I defy any of us to actually be able to do that. So again, we know that this technology is so helpful because it can really ad address patterns. It can look at overall trends and you can see in this system how you can take this information. So on the top, it's sort of a nice little summary, but let's say you wanted to dig down. Let's say you, you, know, you found this very helpful because it kind of gives you, oh, here's my average and, and I can see where I am most of the time. Um, and then you go into your clinic and maybe they want to dig deeper. And if you look at the bottom, you can see the option of digging deeper. And so what I think is really interesting, now that you're home, now that you're feeling that, you know, it's kind of falling to you to figure out how to get out of this, these are some really useful strategies that you can think about as a way of moving forward. And it's it's really just technologies there for you. And, and is it convenient? Um, you know, and, and does it provide the supports that you need? And we know that there are, you know, some technologies are better than others because they can really feed, they can really feed you information that's really, really valuable. Um, and you can see some examples of ways that we, we, you know, use our technology and we have some real opportunities to do this in diabetes. And we actually know that it's helpful.
again, I don't want to bore you with data, but this is a, a, an initial pilot study done in 2008, taking these kinds of technologies and seeing, can they help? So when you actually incorporate these sorts of meters and use the feedback, what do you get from that? And here's what you get from that. And if you just, uh, I, I, again, if you look at the at those bars, what that shows you is the control. So those are the people that didn't use the system. And they their control, their reduction in A1C, so the improvement, so lower your A1C is better, went down by 0.7. But those that used it, it went down by 2%. That's just huge. The difference between that is 1.3%. So that's a pilot study. And here's a follow-up study that involved a lot more people, was done a lot more rigorously. And what did they find? The same thing. So again, you see that same result that we saw before, which is a very significant uh, increase in control associated with the use of these systems. And so let me just end my presentation by illustrating the potential that we have. And, you know, these are great, but how do they translate into practice? So what could you do right now? And I'm just going to illustrate this um, through um, the OneTouch system. The Vario Reflect is actually a, in a way, a smart meter, because what it does is it not only collects the information, but it organizes the information in a way that could provide you with some guidance. And so you can see here, you sort of take a blood glucose rec reading, it's kind of low, and then it, it has some advice here to, to, to sort of treat low. low. Um, it can pro provide some, some impact. It can, it can tell you, okay, it's found a pattern. And is that something that you'd like to look at a little bit? And it also has the ability to kind of provide some encouragement because then it can aggregate and, and help you to sort of get that feedback. And what I love about these kinds of technologies is that work all happens in the background. So it's not like you have to do all that work. You're working hard enough as it is. And if we can begin to leverage technology so that it can take advantage of the work that you do, then it sort of, it, you end up working smarter, not harder. And I think that's really where the important uh, outcomes can be. The other potential is to really take the meter and really connect it to to your phone connected to your clinicians. And so one of the really nice things about this is that it connects to this mobile app and the mobile app will allow you to really dig down. And so when you're interested, it's there for you to tap into. So you don't have to do it every day, but if you have a question, and this is what I really like about diabetes self-management, it's not that you're supposed to, to, to do all this stuff because the self-management behavior is there to answer your questions. Are you high? Find out. Are you low? You can find out. Why are you high? You can find out. What could you do that would be different? Well, you can try some things and find out how it works. And so what we're doing is trying to create this curiosity in a way that allows you to be empowered. And so we don't want you to become a mathematician in order to figure out how to do this. And technology can really support us in this regard. And it also allows you to connect. So when you go in, imagine going into a clinician with a record book, um, and then the clinician is sitting down and looking at, I don't know, 65 numbers and trying to make sense of that. Wouldn't it make sense if you could send that information to your clinician so that they could have it in advance? And that information can be coded and it can be charted, and it really will support and improve our ability to move forward. And it allows this summary. And so again, you can see these two um, results. And so this is um, kind of a mock example um, of where you've got two periods of time, you've got um, a total number of readings, you've got percentages that are in either too low or too high or in the right range. And it's just feedback. Again, think of it as the speedometer. It's not judgment. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is. And if you're not satisfied, well, then, okay, you can have choices. 
and you can use and get information in a way that really works for you. And so this presentation has really been trying to support you in going forward. And my hope is that I've sort of been able to touch on some of the current situation that you might find yourself in, help with strategies for reducing the stress that you're under. And then the encouraging piece is to really reflect and say, can this um, pandemic become an opportunity really for improvement? And that improvement could really be around the self-management, the personal responsibility. Um, and so as I end, I'll just have one final comment. And this is a recent publication that has actually shown that telehealth can actually be really, really effective. And so again, what we're starting to see is that I think you're gonna find that the ability to invite your clinicians into your home so that they're supporting you, not you going into their clinic. I think this shift that the pandemic has kind of forced upon us actually has the potential to, to be really valuable to supporting the diabetes self-management. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this useful.